eventually discussed as we go through the lecture, because I want to illustrate uh, certain ideas, which, uh, which seem to play a lot of a lot, an important role in, in, in theoretical physics these days. And uh, so, the system is uh, a 1 plus 1 dimensional Lagrangian given by a 1 plus 1 dimensional Lagrangian density. Just one real scalar field, which takes where u of phi is half lambda phi square minus a square whole square. Okay, so it has a quartic potential, but shifted by this thing. So it's a double, it's a classic double well potential. So if I plot u of phi versus phi, it it has two minima. Look something like this. So, it's supposed to be symmetric about uh, phi going to minus phi, but I'm not sure that my and the value it takes here at phi equal to zero is a half lambda a power four. Okay. So, the minima of u of phi occur at phi equal to plus or minus. Okay, so, this is a canonical example where you can see I have adjusted, I have shifted things to make my 0 lowest energy uh, value of u is 0. Okay. And so, the classical vacua for this are of course, uh, phi equal to plus a and minus a everywhere of course. So, these are there are two different solutions and so one thing I should point out is that uh, you know quantum mechanically we know that if you have a system with this kind of potential it is not this example, but uh, you know you know that the ground state of the true ground state of the system is actually a symmetric one, but out here this uh, this uh, so let us call these two solutions 1 and 2 or plus and minus probably. So, let me erase this and just say phi plus is a solution where it is equal to plus a and minus a everywhere. Okay. So, so, let us look at the action of various symmetries. Okay. So, for instance, if you look at parity, which is x goes to minus x, we are in 1 plus 1 dimension. Okay. So, if you look at parity, of course, parity is a symmetry of the Lagrangian density is very easy to see, uh, and uh, so. But if you look at the solution under parity, so let's call it P. Under P, you can see that phi plus and phi minus get exchanged. Okay, so if you, if you were in a world where phi plus equal to plus a everywhere, then it's uh, one would say that parity, uh, uh, the action of parity takes you to another solution. So parity is not a symmetry of the solution. So, this is a standard pattern we will observe. If you have a symmetry in your theory, okay, it will be a symmetry of your Lagrangian or of the equations of motion, but that need not be a symmetry of your solution. So, it is action of the solution could be to be an invariance or it could map it to another solution, but what it will do is if, if it is not an invariance of your solution, it will map one solution to another solution. Uh, you are right. So, parity is 
parity. It is invariant under parity, sorry. It is invariant under parity, but not under this other discrete. Sorry, sorry. Yes, thank you. So, it is invariant correction. So, it is invariant under parity. Thank you. <laughs> but there is another discrete symmetry which I would say phi goes to. So, let us call it d for discrete symmetry, phi goes to minus phi, which is also a symmetry and it breaks that. So, under d phi plus goes to phi minus and phi minus goes to phi plus. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so this is a kind of structure which we would see, but if you look at uh, so, but it is uh, if you look at the solutions it is invariant under time translation it is uh, independent of time in any case. It is also in independent of space translations spatial translations as well okay, and it is trivially invariant under boost as well. Okay. So, now comes the interesting thing which we noticed which we had discussed in class earlier was that uh, we can have interpolating solutions okay. and this is an example the reason to look at this one is this is one of the few examples where we have actually an explicit uh, solution analytical solution. Okay. So, we will look at a solution so it will call it the kink soliton okay. and we will put in an ansatz of the following form. Okay. And we need to check if it is a solution. So, the equations of motion Euler Lagrange equations of motion which you derive is just box phi equal to minus u prime. So, we need to put this in uh, into this equation and ask when is phi a solution. Okay. Obviously, because this is a nonlinear function what we will find is that a uh, that uh, for arbitrary values of mu we will not get a solution, but we will find that the answer is yes when as many of you would have checked when mu is lambda a square. Where mu square is is lambda a square. Okay, good. Okay, so the thing is that you do not have much freedom, but this uh, I mean this solution of course takes care of the following interpolation. It at uh, x goes to minus infinity, it goes to minus a. Okay. So, this is the kind of solution that we have this is phi of x versus x. Okay. So, now the, 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 uh, the neat thing about this is that this is a uh, this is of course, the solution is time independent but another feature of this solution is that it has finite energy. So, the Hamiltonian density for the system would be T 0 0 and it would have been D 0 of phi whole square plus half D x of phi x put T okay. and for this particular u of phi look this is also a positive definite quantity it is a square. Okay. So, we have it is a sum of three independent quantities and this is 0 because uh, it is time independent. So, it is a sum of two such quantities and uh, so you end up. So, if you plot the Hamiltonian density versus x for this particular value what you will observe or you would have observed is that first thing is asymptotically it has to go to 0 okay, because it asymptotes to the classical. Vacuum. So, it has to be this way. and it is also a symmetric function of uh, x. Okay. So, the, the, uh, the, uh, the thing out here is that there is a 
you can work out that there is a natural length scale associated with the problem. Uh, what is the length scale? Okay, so so the so natural length scale here is one upon mu. So so there is a natural length scale which is one upon mu, which is equal to in this thing it is uh, square root of one by square root of lambda a square. Okay. So, what this would tell you is this roughly of that order of this length scale, the energy actually goes to 0. So, let us say. So, it could be up to some factor, numerical factors of order 1, but you can ask the following question uh, where is and yeah, the most important thing is that the total energy, which is integral of dx from minus infinity to plus infinity h, is less than infinity. It is actually finite, the I have the number here somewhere. Okay. Yeah, so let me write it out here. So so the energy which is for that solution turns out to be four by three okay. obviously it is less than infinity, it is finite. You could also compute what the momentum of this thing is of t 0 1 and this turns out to be 0, because there is a time derivative and it will, this is if you look at the expression for it, it is just minus d t of phi d x of phi, but the d t of phi is 0. Okay. So, what we have out here is a solution which has finite so, most of its energy is actually in a finite region in space and if you if you look in it is exponentially suppressed if you look at uh, how it behaves out here in this region it is exponentially suppressed. So, 99.999 is actually covered most of the energy is out here it has finite size it has finite total energy and uh, what we will see is that this behaves exactly like a particle which has some size and some mass. Okay. This is the uh, so, it is exactly like this table, this table has some finite extent going from here to here, it has a certain mass okay. and n times c square is an energy okay. and it does not carry any momentum exactly like this. And the key point is this, this uh, we think we are doing a classical field theory, but here we have a classical solution to the equations of motion which behaves exactly like it is no different from this. Okay. And so, to show, show evidence for this. Well, what I had asked you to do was to boost the solution. Okay. So, before, before doing that we will go back and look at the action of various symmetries in the theory. We will see that uh, solution may not be invariant under, under everything. Okay. So, first look at uh, uh, discrete symmetries first or translation. So, time it is the solution is actually time translation invariant okay because there's no time dependence okay but what about spatial translation if you shift the origin or you move things so this thing is a lump of energy which is centered around the origin the way we have chosen it if you do a shift then it moves. Okay. So, you get another solution. So, answer is no. So, what that what does that do? It is uh, suppose we took x goes to x minus a, we get a uh, not a because that is used up. So, let us say alpha and then what we get is a new solution which is Okay. So, that, uh, so that, uh, that is analogous to saying that I can move this table from here to here, I can shift it by a bit okay. and that is exactly and we will not say that they are the same solution, they are different solutions. So, here is a case where a symmetry of your theory is, uh, is not a symmetry of the solution, but it will always map a solution to another solution, if, okay. but sometimes of course, it will map a solution to itself like it did here. Okay. What about again? Parity. 
parity would be x goes to minus x. So, the solution under parity goes to phi of x. Again, it gives you a new solution. It is a new solution because the asymptotics at plus and minus infinity get exchanged. Okay. So, if you call the first solution a kink, this is sometimes called an anti kink. The reason it is called a kink is uh, I guess because of the structure of okay, it is a, it's a kink in space okay, having some finite energy okay, and this is called an anti kink. It is just semantics what I call kink and what I call anti kink. Is, uh, okay, it's just uh, this thing. Okay, so so now comes what about boosts? Okay, so under boosts, x goes to gamma into x minus some ut, right? And t prime goes to and and what is t prime? by c is 1 in our notation. So, it is just it's the same thing. Yeah, it has to be the other way it does not make sense. right? So, gamma it should be exactly like this t minus u x that would have been factors of c square etcetera. Okay, this is what we would get and so the point here now is this if you go the ahead and plug it, plug it into, uh, into the new solution or maybe I should do it the other way. right? So, that I uh, passive active business let us do it this way. So, I plug this into the same solution I get a new solution except now it is not a time independent solution. Now, it depends on time okay, and it is a nice fun exercise which you have hopefully enjoyed doing which is to work out. So, the new solution under boost I am dropping the prime. So, this is a new solution and it is fun to actually go back and check you know you, you do not have to believe that this is a solution or whatever you can go back and check plug and check that it does satisfy the equation of motion. Okay. But the fun part is to work out what is now in this case both E is not 0 P is also not 0. Okay. And uh, so, now now is where the, the uh, proof of the pudding or whatever is is to look at the uh, so, I told you we can think of this as some object which has mass which is given by this energy. Okay, so, if you boost it we know that this these things will get changed and if you use the standard formulae you would find that okay, let us call it E prime would be 4 by 3 mu a square cosh of this thing which would be just a gamma factor, but P would be what is p? Sin hyperbolic of so wait. Let me write this. I always think in terms of of the boo of the rapidity, which is a beta, and this would be sin hyperbolic of beta, where cos beta is just gamma, and tan beta is u. So from this you can work out what this is. Okay. This is what u gamma, yes. So, this is equal to 4 third mu a square u gamma. Okay. So, what this tells you if you go back and check is e square minus p square is invariant, it is equal to the square of this. So, what we see is exactly the dispersion relation of a particle which has this property of okay. So, we started out with a solution which was time independent, but by, by boosting it we got a solution, but now this object is behaving like 
a, a body which is moving with uh, velocity u. So, again it sort of led, lends credence to the fact that we can think of this as a uh, lump of energy. Okay. And so, it, in some sense it does behave like a relativistic particle, because the re dispersion relation is relativistic. Okay. So, uh, in, in this course we will see that there are many different kinds of solutions, which you would see, which have similar properties. Okay. And so, there are situations, as I will discuss later, that this particle interpretation may be taken seriously. Okay. Not for this example, this is a very toy example, but we could do a little bit more complicated solutions, but we can no longer uh, write out analytic solutions. Okay. Suppose, so now we know we have boosted solutions, suppose I have a following uh, sort of uh, initial configuration at some time. So, I have uh, let me let me just draw a picture, so that uh, uh, yes, this is what I want. Yes, so I take a uh, so in this thing I have a kink moving with some velocity u in this direction. Okay, so this is a kink, phi kink, moving from left to right, and this would be an anti-kink. Okay, and let's say it's. I could move uh, choose a different velocity, but just for simplicity, I could think of uh, this thing. And if they are separated by quite far apart, if this distance of separation between the center is very large, to a very good approximation, uh, phi of so let's just write out phi if I take it to be phi kink with uh, at uh, at location say minus l by 2 moving with velocity u. So, here I am just writing out a kink moving at, uh, centered at minus l by 2 located at plus l by 2 plus anti kink located at plus by 2 with velocity minus u. Okay. So, it is very easy to write out what I mean by these two solutions. So, uh, as you can see as l is very very large uh, compared to this length scale or rather this length scale, this is a, to a very good approximation, it is a good solution. Okay. Now, so let us say this is your configuration at some initial time. Now, the question is let you let the system evolve okay. and you can ask what happens to this. So, clearly at some point these two things will collide okay. and in terms of energy, if I draw the profile, I will have something like this something like this. Of course, uh, there is no dissipation of energy in the system, energy is conserved. So, obviously, this cannot go to uh, it cannot uh, go down to the vacuum. Okay. So, now the question is can they go through each other? The answer is no, because the asymptotics here are at plus infinity and minus uh, infinity both it is going to minus a. Okay. So, that cannot if they go through each other that would correspond to uh, actually flipping. So, that cannot happen. Okay, so, what can happen? What do you think will happen? They will rebound of each, of each other. Okay. So, actually this is a weird yes, that is what happens, but it depends on the value of u. So, here is the fun thing, what you should do is to actually go ahead write out a program or whatever, which would do this evolution. Okay. What you will find is there is uh, this, this, this kink has a funny behavior, below some critical value of u, it, they tend to kind of stick to each other, does not bounce off. But if the u is above that critical value, it actually bounces off. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, I have seen a simulation of this where it does this sort of a thing. So, but the, what you have to do is to convert the problem into a uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation into a Hamiltonian kind of equation, and that's not so hard. I mean, uh, so once you do that, you can actually. So here's a case of an approximate solution, but it's pretty good. So, you do the evolution and whatever you get after that and what you should do is to basically point plot if you wish the energy density as a function of time. So, uh, you will see initially that uh, I mean these things come and they come close and they collide and go off. Okay. There is another theory where which is called the sine Gordon theory, where the potential is up to some factors it is a, a sine function. Okay. Now, this is a solution theory which has uh, infinite number of uh, 
because the potential ok I will have to shift it obviously. Uh, so, minus what is it mm, the lowest value is minus 1. So, I add a 1 and there will be some factors etcetera that is not so relevant what is important is to. So, yeah this is the this is the kind of potential you can see that uh, for every every time sin phi hits minus 1 uh, you have a minimum out here. Okay. So, it has infinite number of minima. So, unlike uh, the, the example where we considered there were only two things you find that you have so minimum minima occur when sin phi equal to. So, again there might be some uh, some dimensional parameters, but the what I, I mean when the sign of this thing takes values which is equal to minus 1 and when does that happen? When it is equal to 3 pi by 2 plus okay, so it is like uh, so there is 3 pi by 2 plus 2 n pi is it this is the periodicity of this thing. So, you have an infinite number of vacua unlike here where there are only two possibilities now you can see that I can have I will have a vacua number I mean I will have solutions which can interpolate uh, between uh, uh, you know uh, vacua corresponding to some n going to n prime. So, I will have infinite such things and in this example I can actually do things like you know now you can you can actually have uh, many other possibilities and this one actually is, is uh, in some sense here you will find that the things behave elastically in some way things can go through each other you can have all sorts of things because everything. Okay, so, this this, uh, this so this is called the sign garden equation just uh, go ahead and look at Google or whatever and uh, look up this equation and uh, even the name of how it was named the uh, sign garden model is an interesting story I, I will leave you to find out why it was called that. Okay. So, this is uh, an exercise which I would recommend you try uh, try out. Okay. So, so, this looks very exciting and it looks like I can go ahead and construct all kind of uh, you know look at time independent solutions in uh, in um, in arbitrary dimensions and one may think that 1 plus 1 is uh, you know uh, we just used it because it was a toy example etcetera, but there is a there is something which sort of messes up the whole thing and it says that uh, it goes by the name of Derek's theorem. Okay. Basically, it says that there are no such solutions in higher dimensions. I will not be no time independent finite energy solutions in space dimensions greater than 1. The proof is very, very simple. So, I will explain the argument for it, but before I do that I should tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the Hamiltonian density and the Lagrangian density are related by a Legendre transform you know that. And the key point to remember is that uh, uh, Legendre transforms map extrema to extrema. Okay. So, the problem of, uh, of, uh, of uh, extremizing the action or minimizing the energy actually get become related. So, what we will show the way we will show the we will show this is to consider the energy and uh, uh, let us say that you give me a solution if I can show you that there exists a similar solution with lower energy then obviously, that is a, that would be a closer to the solution okay. and if I show you that the lowest energy configuration is where the whole thing goes away then we are more or less I am telling you that there is no such solution. Okay. So, the, so we could just uh, you want to have a concrete model in mind take the same Lagrangian density except change the dimension to d plus 1. Okay. So, so let us let us ask how that goes. So, let us look at the energy density because it is time independent has only two components it has uh, kinetic energy. Uh, so, let not energy let us look at the energy.
Okay. So let's assume. So let's just go ahead and call. We'll just call this term KF, and we'll call this term. What did I call it? VF. Okay. So suppose. phi equal to some phi f of x is is such a solution okay and let's uh, let uh, actually let me k f denote the contribution of this term the k e and p f that of the potential energy. So, e is some finite energy let us even call it. So, let us just write okay. So, what I will do for you is to give you a uh, consider one parameter family of uh, new solutions and I ask what is the lowest energy. Okay. So, let us just define phi of x which is a new solution with some parameter alpha. I just define it to be phi x of alpha x, alpha is just some parameter. So, all I am doing is to rescale the variable. Okay, so, now we can just go ahead and ask how these terms change. Okay, so, let us look at k f. So, we want to ask what is the kinetic energy. So, we want to do integral d d x of half gradient of phi of x alpha. Okay, gradient yeah, okay. this is what we want to do, but this is just phi f scaled. So, I can rescale things and pull things out. Okay. So, I can I can redefine let x prime be equal to alpha x. Okay. So, so, this will go to, so d d implies d d x equal to d x prime d divided by alpha power d because every spatial coordinate is scaled. So, I get 1 by alpha power d coming from the change of variables okay. and then there is a, a, I also have gradient prime which should be equal to mm -hmm. Is this correct? Uh, X prime is uh, this thing, so no. This is what I get. Okay. So what I can do is now I just want to write everything in terms of prime variables. So what I will get here is that d by dx. So I'll get a alpha square coming from here times prime variables. But now you can see that this is uh, phi of x. It's like alpha is gone, so that's nothing but it is phi f of alpha of x prime. Okay. So if I put these things together, I get alpha power two minus d times this is just the original value, which is kf. Okay. So by this scaling, I have actually got. I can re uh, by in, uh, redoing the variables, I get this. Similarly, you can we can check that uh, what about uh, uh, Vf? It's only a scalar function, so all I all I will get will be a alpha power minus d. So e of the new solution is just alpha power two minus d kf plus alpha power minus d Vf, where kf and Vf are just some numbers given.
So, let me rewrite what I have. Okay, and this is a function of alpha. Okay, so if you have given me some time-independent finite energy solution, if I want that, I mean, I've got a one-parameter family. I extremize this with respect to alpha, and if I get the lowest energy configuration, which is lower than that, then I would say that that is uh, has a greater chance of being uh, the exact solution to the equation of motion. So we just go ahead and do this, we have one parameter family, I just extremize it. So, what do I get here? I get this, so I get 2 minus d ok. So, this is what I get. So, I need to solve so, solve for alpha, whatever alpha I get here, I have to check if it is an, I still need to do one more step, but what are the values of, so let us, is this correct, 1 minus d, this thing, ok. So, yeah, uh, so what do I do next, yes, so I can just pull out uh, this thing, alpha power, I multiply everything by alpha power d plus 1, is that correct? Okay, so, the, uh, actually it is just alpha square, no let me, I just, just simple. So, alpha square into 2 minus d minus d okay, or alpha square equal to d v f by 2 minus d k f. Okay, uh, there is a problem. I mean, now you look out here. Uh, so, <coughs> so first thing is what happens when d equal to one. So first thing is d greater than two. This is a negative number. For t greater than two, the two minus d is less than 0, these are all positive numbers, remember that. So, this solution would be pure imaginary, so that is not ok, because you have a real scalar field, ok. So, that is uh, that has a problem, ok, but for d equal to 1, uh, for d equal to 1 there is indeed a nice solution and d equal to 2, you can see that the, the solution corresponds to alpha going to infinity. Is this clear? Okay, but we can also view it in a slightly different manner. Sub, uh, what would happen? Let's assume that phi f is indeed the solution. So that would imply when were phi f could, would be a solution. If if uh, equal to zero and d square e by d alpha square uh, is greater than 0. These are the two conditions. Okay. So, so let us uh, at alpha equal to 1, because we want, we are, we are claiming somebody is coming up with a solution, putative solution. So, question is can, can this happen? Okay. And uh, so, let us do, uh, let us see what happens at d equal to 1. Okay, so d uh, so at d equal to one, uh, if you plug this in, so you get one here, and this is also one, and alpha is one. So you, uh, this will imply that uh, we need k f equal to v f. Okay, and uh, what does that imply? Uh, so this was uh, so k f. Uh, what was k f? That came from the integral. Of uh, of uh, of the kinetic energy, and this came from the integral of the potential energy. So, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is that 
uh, the key point here is that uh, this this can happen if half okay yeah wait wait let's let's we are just uh, doing this so what we get here is that grad phi square or grad phi should be it's just in one dimension so i just write it out like this dx of phi should be equal to square root of 2 plus or minus square root of u of phi if this is true now the neat stuff is now we actually this is a first order differential equation if uh, yeah we have a second order equation but you can go back and actually verify that the kink solution that we wrote so one of the plus sign is if plus sign is the kink the other is the anti kink you can check that it actually satisfies a first order equation instead of satisfying a second order equation okay and you can verify that that is indeed the case okay but what happens in the other cases so what happens when d equal to 2 when d equal to 2 and alpha equal to 1 you can see that that would require v f should be equal to 0 but when is that possible that implies that it has to be a classical minima everywhere so there exists so this implies if you give me a solution this implies that this has to be the classical vacuum I will come back to my earlier discussion okay. and, uh, wha and what happens for d greater than 2, this becomes a sum of two negative terms, this also becomes negative, this also becomes negative. So, really the only way it can be 0 is if both are simultaneously 0. Okay, so this is the only way this can happen. Okay, so let actually let me come back and discuss what's going on. If we can still go through this process, but what this will show you is that it uh, it sort of uh, makes. Uh, uh, so suppose you have something which has finite energy and some size. Okay, by scaling it, you can actually scrunch that thing and make it smaller and smaller, and then it sort of makes sense for it to completely be of zero size. It'll just disappear in some sense and so that is like saying it becomes the classical vacuum at the end of the day okay so that cannot be a solution so this looks like bad news this tells you that there are no finite energy time independent solutions in higher dimensions there is a scale there is a scale which one so lagrangian that we start off with yeah. doesn't have any scale why why doesn't it it does it has a mass term and it has it has i mean there are things which have dimensions of dimension or length there are things okay that's not the issue so but the key point i mean there's also something which is uh, if you go to two dimension for instance i mean you need to specify boundary conditions at the circle at infinity so let's say we took the same five fourth uh, potential, which has two vacua. Okay. So when we when we when when we had one dimension, we could we could cho choose plus infinity to be one thing and minus infinity. But here you have to actually set it, uh, you know, continuously. So suppose you said that this this region is going to be a plus a. Now if you un unless you permit some discontinuity, okay, you are forced to choose uh, a plus a everywhere it gets only worse in higher dimensions if you have a sphere you can uniform so the point is that uh, in in one dimension there was no way for me to go from this to this plus infinity but if i go to two dimensions easily they they're smoothly connected by at a circle at infinity so again there is not enough space okay and uh, to actually write out a solution so the only solutions that you have which are finite energy are the vacuum solutions and that's it so, th this is uh, a typical example of what is called a no-go theorem. 
but the funniest things or the nicest things about no go theorems is that they can be evaded okay and we will see in this course how this can be evaded it happens in a very nice manner but that will you will have to wait for maybe a few lectures when we get to that point okay so so derrick's theorem is kind of nails the coffin it tells you that you do not have solutions which which can have finite energy i mean i'm not saying that there are no configurations without finite. i mean there, i'm sure there are but they won't be solutions to your equations of motion okay and uh, in fact uh, i would recommend uh, uh, coleman's uh, edice lectures So, it is a book uh, titled uh, Aspects of Symmetry, in fact in that uh, he has a, it is a series of lectures on different topics at in Ariche he used to give a, a set of lectures over many years. So, it was compiled I think 4 or 5 years, so it has some each lecture is sort of independent of this thing, but he has something on what he calls solitons or whatever finite energy solutions one of his uh, lectures are on, is on this topic and in fact out there he gives a time dependent finite energy solution just to give you a counter example i mean here i clearly said things are time independent okay so that's a counter example in some particular model but just that's enough to this thing okay so but uh, what we are talking about is time independent finite energy solutions there are and that's uh, that uh, and that's a consequence of derrick's theorem okay